28 seconds left. We're going to go ahead and start. Um, our call to worship this morning is, this is the day. This is the day. Let's stand. We'll sing through twice. And y'all sing. This is the day. This is the day. you to Ace Seville Baptist Church this morning. Uh, if this is your first time visiting, could I get you to raise your hand? We got some gifts back here for you. That usually brings them out of the woodwork, but ain't nobody raising their hand. So we're all home folk here this morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, I was handed a note this morning to make sure we uh, put Mr. Larry Lash on our prayer list. He's twisted a muscle uh, in his neck and having some real discomfort. I talked to Miss Gwen for just a minute in the back, and she said he's having a really hard time right now. And I think the chiropractor's trying to get him straightened out. So you remember Larry and the family there with his uh, problem with his neck, and uh, be praying for the family of Clarence Martin who passed away this past week. Uh, it's good to uh, have Mr. John Watkins with us this morning. He's the director of missions at Saluda Baptist Association. And, of course, we are a part of Saluda Baptist Association. Good to have you here this morning. We appreciate you coming. Uh, I won't take the time to reintroduce you before you come up. So just when we finish up, you just come on up and use the pulpit like your own. And we certainly appreciate you coming to share with us this morning. Uh, keep in mind or mark your calendars that Adam Crabb will be here in concert on Friday, April 26th. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, be praying for Kyle Sonnefeld. He'll be back tonight. That's the young man that shared with us last Sunday night. Uh, definitely, definitely a, a called young man. And just uh, be praying for him as he prepares to come and share with us tonight. A uh, couple of birthdays, one, one I can't forget because I think I spent about all day yesterday with her uh, but uh, Macy's birthday is today so happy birthday Macy wherever you at where's she at where you at oh, hey, hey. You, you, how old are you Five. okay okay I figured you'd let them know and Portia Lauder I'd be a happy birthday to you too hon and that'll be this week so uh, there ain't none of us getting no uh, younger but boy when Macy turns five I feel old she wears me out most days. So we, we certainly appreciate everybody that's here this morning. Uh, uh, Monday at 6 p.m. will be the Women's Encouragement Group, uh, Group Women's Bible Study, and we'll have a deacon's meeting this coming Thursday. Uh, Sunshiners meeting, uh, still at the pond, a fish fry on April the 20th at 6 p.m. We'll have a business meeting next Sunday. Um, and there's something else that I had in mind think I looked through and saw and I'm I'm sure I'm forgetting it which somebody will tell me when it's all over with but anyway that's it as far as I know except for whatever I forgot and she didn't put it on here well sh shame on you Miss Jean so happy birthday to Miss Jean she didn't want nobody to know I guess because you know she put this thing together for us every week well, happy birthday, Miss Jean, and we certainly appreciate everything you do, hon. Uh, I, I guess that's it, so let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you 
for today. We thank you for this time to come into your house and, and look into your word. And Lord, would you just open our hearts to receive that word that you're uh, bringing our way this morning. I just pray that you would be with our speaker, Lord. You would just, you would just minister to him as he shares from the pulpit what the Lord's laid on his heart. Lord, would you be with these, uh, the family uh, that lost a loved one? Lord, would you be with them this week? Would you be with Brother Larry as, as he struggles with pain in his neck? I just pray that you would just touch him in a special way, Lord, and bring him back to a, a recovery that, uh, that would be uh, a whole lot more pleasant than what he's going through now. And, Lord, would you just uh, be with us throughout this day and bring us back this evening at the next appointed time. This prayer, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offertory hymn uh, today is just a little talk with Jesus. Stand, please. We'll sing all three verses. If the ushers will come on the third and final verse. <laughs> Well, let's take a little time to shake hands. I was kind of going backwards on that. I was going to let Miss Sharon come sing first, but uh, 
we'll uh, we'll go ahead and shake hands and uh, hug your neighbor this morning. And after after that, you just come on, brother, and you share what the Lord's laid on your heart. Y'all pray, uh, pray for me while I try to sing On the Banks of the Promised Land.
Amen, amen. Thank you. I want to thank you for the privilege of being with you this morning. I've um, been here once before, I think, and preached with, for you, spoke for you, and uh, I'm just grateful that you're a partner with 84 churches uh, in the Saluda Baptist Association that we can seek to reach this community and this county for Christ and, um, and beyond. We, we hope that we can pray, uh, praise the Lord as we see lives change, not even past Anderson County, but we have thousands and thousands here that need to understand and know the gospel of Christ and they need to receive it in their heart and their life and make him Lord of their life. So um, continue to pray for the work of the association. We're going to even be talking tomorrow with some churches that might be interested in starting a church in different parts of our county that is uh, essential growing areas. Um, our whole county seems to be growing quickly. Um, thank you for being letting me be here this morning with you. So I'm going to um, begin with a word of prayer as we look over God's word and um, you know, the, the promised land is uh, in some of the original promised land areas in our country, in our world, um, land of Israel and Jerusalem and place of the temple where Jesus will take down the eastern gate at some point with his return. Um, all that is under such turmoil. And um, just pray for them this morning. Pray that God will speak to our hearts as we open his word. So, Father, thank you for this morning. I pray, pray God, that as we see continued turmoil arising in our world, and Father, turmoil of wars and rumors of wars, and Father, it just helps us even keep an eye, a watchful eye, that your return is even closer and closer every day. So Father, I just pray for families in these countries that are in this war, and Father, no matter how we look at it, it's a, it's a tragic thing. And um, Father, we just pray, God, for wisdom, for God, your guidance that leaders will seek you as they continue in these steps. But Father, we pray for protection. We pray for the protections of lives, and um, we pray for peace to come soon. And Lord, we thank you that we can call upon you because you're our Prince of Peace. You're the one who gives all wisdom and all knowledge as we seek you. So God, guide us in your word today as we look into... Uh, how we can love you more, and we're grateful for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If I asked you that question, and I asked you to say, I want you to answer this question, I love blank. Now, I don't know, um, I think your pastor seems to be a, a fan of football down in the center of the state. Is that right? That's right. I think he is. So I'm going to say, if I say, answer that question, if I love Clemson, which he'll love me for that, and um, I appreciate him greatly. Um, if I say I love Clemson football, and somebody says, well, how would you know you love Clemson football? Well, maybe it's because have little flags that fly on the window, that you go to the football games, that you have orange and purple and whatever gear with these paw prints all over them, and you have all this stuff, and you talk about games, and you talk about scores of games, and you, you talk about how this player and this player is doing this, and you go all over the place. If, if I truly loved something, you would know just because of all of that. And then I, would, then I would ask you the question, well, if, if, how would you convince someone to love Clemson football just as much as I do? Well, you'd say, well, you know, I, I, I mean, the energy of the going in and that stadium and the crowd and, and all this, it's so much fun. It's, it, I would tell them all these great things to try to convince them to love it as much as I do. Well, the challenge that we have in life and the, the situations we find ourselves in on loving things of this world is to transfer that love to someone else. You've got to love it yourself quite a bit. And when Luke, 9, Luke 14 this morning, Luke 14 in chapter tw in verse 25, um, we're going to talk about what it means to love God. We're going to talk about what it means to love Him and to love Him Above everything else, this passage is a challenging passage in a lot of ways because it has um, a great, uh, brings a great awareness to us about what it means to follow after Christ. So Luke 14, and verse 25, it says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. 
And whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going, into, going out to an encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men uh, to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple." You know, those are challenging words. Those are difficult words to hear because we love our family and we love the things that God's provided for us and we love the encouragement that comes from that. But what God's saying here is there's a few things I want us to understand about what it means to love God. And the first thing I want you to understand is this. God calls us to love God supremely. Love God supremely. Well, as we think of this loving God supremely, it's all, all our love for God is so strong that any love in comparison to it would appear as hatred. It's not as strong a love for anything else except for Him, first and foremost. Now, that, that some, some folks say, well, priorities in my life are God first, then my wife or, sp- or my husband or whatever it might be, and then my family and that kind of thing after that. Well, do we really understand and truly know, and are we really committed to say, I love God supremely above everything else? Because we can get focused on our family. We can get focused on our children and grandchildren or boyfriend or girlfriend, or we can focus on relationships here on this earth. And maybe that, those relationships might be going through a rough patch. It might be going through a challenging time. But what we need to understand is any any fix that we're going to find, we, we look for fixes in this world, right? Everybody advertises everything that they think we need to fix something in our life. Well, anything we look toward in life is not going to compare to our, the power and strength that comes from loving God. You see, if we love Him first and foremost, which is what this text is calling us to, supremely above everything else, then the love that we have for all these other things that are important to us, our spouse spouse or children or grandchildren or anything like that, that love will strengthen far beyond anything we can try to do on our own. See the the connection there? If we love God supremely above all else, then the love for all those people and relationships and things will change drastically. So you want to help start working on your relationship with someone you love God more. Put Him first. You know, this truth, as we find in the Bible, is a challenge, especially in the times when this was written. So the Jewish tradition was that um, family was incredibly important. I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the children of Israel were given this incredible challenge. And it says in verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart. Now, when we think of those, that verse right there, we think of that passage. That was the anchor passage of those that were in the Jewish faith. That was that anchor passage to say, you're going to love God with everything you have. You're gonna, it, it was a challenge because it, it went against the, the cultural tradition of everything you did was to take care of your family. Now, if it were a rich person in the culture of that day, the mom and dad would have a house that they would live on the bottom. And then as their family grew, their children married off to someone, they'd build another level on that house and they'd live on the second floor and the mom and dad would live on the first floor. 
Y'all want to try that? That would be kind of challenging some. Well, the interesting thing when he says this in these verses, that you shall love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. So you want to understand what it means to love God above everything else supremely. We need to understand the heart, soul, and strength. You see, our heart is what we're passionate about. The heart is what drives that, that passion in, our, our, in ourselves that, that we want to do that. We, we get excited about doing something. We think about someone or something that we love to do. That's our passion. Well, our soul is what we are committed to. It, it what is what we say we have a conviction for. And so if we're passionate about something, if we love God with our heart, we're passionate about Him. He is first and foremost the focus of our life. We're passionate about Him because we experience and understand His love for us. We understand the sacrifice He gave for us that we might have eternal life in a relationship with Him. So if we are passionate about that, then our soul builds convictions to say, this is what's important. This is the anchor of my life. I'm passionate about it, but I've made a choice to say this is a conviction that I'm going to follow above everything else. And then it, then it goes on to say, with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. Well, your strength is your body, your physical body, and your mind saying, I am going to be committed to do this. I'm doing something about it. So when we see in the Luke 14 passage that you have to love God above everything else, you can say that you love God. Oh, I love God. He's first in my life. But are we committed to do something about it? Are we committed that our, our time, that our energy, that our focus and that strength part of us are we committed to say, I truly love God and somebody else is going to know that I do love God? Somebody's going to see that in my life, that everything I do, I do because I love him first and foremost above everything else. So our heart is our passion. Our soul is what our commitment and convictions come from. And then our strength is we're going to do something about it. We're going to do something. We're going to live our life in a way to live out our convictions that are based upon our passion for God. So it's really interesting as we look at those two passages, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, and the story has not changed. You see, Jesus in this passage here, he says, I want you to give up everything else, even your own life. Are you really committed to say, I'm going to stop thinking about life, of, of thinking about me, and I'm going to start thinking about Him. Am I going to go from a me-centered life to a God-centered life? Because everything that we get in, that, that is infiltrated into everything we see and hear in the world that we live in, it says, oh, it's all about you. It's all about me. If you're not happy, go find another relationship. If you don't like that phone, get the next new one. If you don't like that car, go get something else. It doesn't matter how much debt you go into. It doesn't matter how much you sell your soul kind of thing. To so all these things of the world that are saying they're going to make you happy and say that you're going to have pleasure from, it doesn't mean anything. He says, we need to get me off the throne of my life. We need to put him as the first and the center part of everything we do. He says, it's not about me. We need to be careful sometimes when we come to church, we like to make everything about me. There used to be an old gospel song, and you might know it, called Excuses. You remember that song? Anybody remember that song? No? Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. You remember that? So, and it says, now the devil will provide them if from church you'll stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. But to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Well, it goes through all these funny little, little verses in there. Talking about being too cold or too hot or it's too loud or too soft. It's, it's talking about the, the preacher goes too long or maybe he doesn't talk loud enough. You know, it talks about all these things that we keep for excuses. Now, if we do that just to come to church or not, what are we going to do seven days a week when we're supposed to be passionate about living for God every day of our life? What kind of excuses are we going to put in the way to say, well, God, I don't feel like it today. I don't feel like making choices that honor God. I feel like doing what I want to do. Well, hopefully, if your passion and your commitment, your heart and your soul 
or toward the love of God, that on those days you're going to say, well, you know what? It's not about me today. I'm going to ask the Lord what he would have me do today. I'm going to ask the Lord, what's, what am I going to do to honor him today with my life? I'm going to ask him what it is that he wants me to do. Well, the question I have for this point is, what is something that would be difficult to love less so you can love God supremely? Because I know you're probably thinking about that. You're like, how can you? Man, I really love this in my life. I love this one thing. And I don't know if I can say that I'm going to give up some time there because I need to love God more. I need to give up my thought patterns that I don't need to watch those things that I'm watching. I don't need to look at those things that I'm looking at on my phone. I don't need to go to the places that I like going to because there's a lot of fun and whatever else might be involved with it. <clears throat> because I want to live my life to honor God. I want to live Him, live to focus and follow Him. Well, the second thing in this passage that we can learn is that we need to love God unconditionally. Unconditionally. There's a commitment there that has to be so strong that, that, that no matter what else happens in life, we're going to say, I am following after Him. Because Christ here is not asking for some emotional appeal. He's not wanting you to make an emotional decision to follow Him. He's wanting you to make an, a specific, deliberate decision that whatever you do, you have to love me above everything else in life. There is no emotional appeal here. He wants careful consideration to be made to follow after Him because here's the thing, life is hard. And when we are squeezed, what's going to come out? Are we going to be Him when the challenge comes? Or is it going to be full of all this other stuff that we get from the world that we live in? So when you choose to follow Christ, verse 28 through 30, we need to know when we choose to follow Christ, we need to count the cost. We need to say, you know what? He called me to follow Him no matter what. That we need to count the cost that I'm willing to do that. Am I willing to sacrifice everything else to say He is first and foremost in my life? And He knew that was important. He knew when He made this challenge that those in the world that did not know Him would have no use. They'd be, they, they would be... Um, they have nothing but contempt for someone who's half-hearted and following after him. Well, you might ask why. Well, he wants the followers to value him above everything else, like an unconditional surrender. The, the Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to man, but, in it, but its end is the way to death. So a commitment without reservation is when you go and you're working among people or you're, going, you're, you're socializing with other people, and your world and your life is acting exactly like someone who is living not for Christ, that doesn't know Him, and somebody says, well, when tragedy comes your way and you just totally melt down and explode, and notice, where's the faith that you say that we have? That we have? They're going to look at you and say, well, you live life just like I do, and I don't follow Christ, and you say you do. See that contempt that they would have? They want to know that, well, what's the difference? Where's this strength and power that you say God gives you to walk through life each day? Where's this, you know, where's this decision making, these values you say you have when you say this isn't important in life to do, to do the things in this world, uh, but you do it as well? They're going to look at you and say, "Did you? what are you really talking about? Why do I need this God that you're talking about? Because life for you looks a whole lot life, like life for me. Now, folks, I, I don't think that anything is going to be perfect in this life because there's circumstances along the way that it, it makes it difficult to express our love for God. There is some circumstances. doesn't mean we, we don't need to express our love for God. I'm just saying there's difficult times in life. Everybody has gone through a tragedy or a difficult time of loss at some point in time or we're probably ready to be in it. Life is hard, but what are you going to express to those around you? Have you really counted that cost when the challenge and the pressure comes? Have you really counted that cost that I'm living for him? And I'm going to let other people know I am. I might not understand. I tell you, I, and 
years ago, uh, in 2017, my, I lost my dad. He fell in my home, hit his head, had a major brain, brain bleed. Five days later, we had to pull him off of machines. That was hard. That was incredibly hard. And the pressure that, that you go through there and the questions you might have and the agony you might feel, those are all emotions that you experience. But I remember three hours we stood with him in his room. Three hours and we sang hymns and we prayed and we cried and sang a little bit more and we prayed and we cried. I mean, just over and over, three hours. We didn't understand. We were hurt. But our faith was there. And little did we know the ICU nurse that was with us, she was standing out in the, in the hallway and she heard us the whole time. For three hours. She came up to me afterwards. She goes, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. And I've never experienced anything like this. How? I said, well, we can't understand or know why God wants this to take place right now. But we know where the strength has come from. And we know that when he took his last breath on this earth, his faith became sight. He was standing before his Lord. So. Something as gravely tragic as that is one thing, but we go through tough, difficult, challenging things here every day. Somebody might say something that, that is really hurtful and mean, and what's going to come back in your response? Somebody might say something that's not truthful about you, and what are you going to come back in your response? Are you going to share with them, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry for this misunderstanding, but... Whenever we can work this out, I want, to exp I want it to work out. Or do we fire right back at them and say, well, you, and all this stuff right back at them. What's our response when tragedy comes, when challenge comes, when hurt comes? We've got to love them unconditionally, no matter whether times are good or times are not so good. The last thing we need to do is love God consistently. Verse 34 and 35 uh, actually down at the end of this verse in 33 and on, he goes on to talk about um, the consistency of our love for him. Because I didn't read those verses to you. That's why I didn't turn my page. Let me read that verse to you. Verse 34 is, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? But it, it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears, let him hear. You know, the display of our love for God or the lack of our display of our love for God is going to influence those around us like we said. But God gives us the perfect example of what love is. 1 John 4, verse 7 through 13 shares an ex incredible expression of God's love for us. 1 John 4, verse 7 through 13 says this. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love, who does not love, does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, let if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because he has given us his given us of his spirit as we read those kinds of verses and we in the bible and we see and understand because god's love is expressed in so many ways he says a word in there called it was made manifest to us his love was made manifest to us meaning he displayed it he gave us the perfect example of his love now when we think that 
we have to express our love to God and love Him above everything else, there should be manifestations of our love. Now, that's not some super spiritual word or nothing. That's just the reality of it is going to be noticed. It will show up in our conversations. It will show up in our actions. It will show up in how we treat one another. It will show up all over the place if we love God. Because His love was shown to us first, and if we're a believer in Christ, and we've given our heart and our life to Christ, then we have received, we are receivers, partakers of His love. So if we've received His love, we need to display His love. And that's one way we're to love Him. Why? Because we want to live by His example. I'll tell you, my, my son, um, my son um, will come down sometimes in the morning and he'll see what I'm wearing to go to church. And he'll go back upstairs and put on something very similar to what I have on. on. He'll look at me and, and, and we're doing something outside and working like yesterday I had, I put my hat on, we're working in the yard and had a, a brimmed hat and I uh, asked him to go grab it for me and he came out with a brimmed hat on as well. Now listen, that's because he loves his dad. But what if I don't show my love for God to him? God wants us to display his love by loving one another. And the only way we can love one another is if we're abiding in him. Now, that word abide is something that is so important of a word in the, in the, in the Bible. Abiding means to live or dwell or remain in something. I love that last word mostly. We're to live in God. We're, he's to live in us, in and through us. We're to dwell in His presence. We're to spend time focused on His Word because the only way we're going to know how to love God is if we know about God. That's the only way we're going to learn to love Him more is you need to know more about Him. I don't know about you, but when I, was, um, when I was started dating my wife and I was thinking, well, man, I might, I might love her. Well, what did I do? I want to know everything about her. I studied her. I want to know what she liked. I want to know what she didn't like. I want to, I like, I want to know where she liked to go. I want to, know, I want to know everything about her. I was a student of the gal that I was dating, right? Well, I'm going to give you a little, let me give you a little sidebar here. If you want to stay in love with your spouse, stay a student of them. Keep learning about them. You need to know everything there is about them. You think you might know everything about them, but you don't. Trust me, 34 years, I'm still learning. All the time. But God says, I want you to dwell. I want you to come into my presence and dwell so you know more about me. You know how much I love you. You know how much I require of you as my child. Don't you have little requirements of your children, your grandchildren? You know, come into grandma's house, you take your shoes off at the door. You know, don't stay in the kitchen while I'm cooking. My, my, Michelle used, my wife used to say, her grandma used to say, get out yonder. Get, get out of the kitchen don't you even come near the kitchen. But here's, we got to dwell. we got to learn about Him. we got to know Him. So at those times when, when challenge comes, that last understanding of the word abide is we remain in Him. No matter what the circumstances, we're going to be consistent to remain in Him. And the challenge is, is what if we don't remain in Him? What if, like in verse 34 and 35, that the salt loses its taste? See, we don't have salt like that. We have this thing called iodized, iodinized, whatever it's called, right? We have salt that's purified. If you go to the Holy Land, you go to the Dead Sea, you can grab salt in balls like this, and it hurts. You've got to wear shoes going in the water. And you, gotta, you can pick up handfuls of balls of salt. Now, the salt they used back in the Bible times here was not pure. And it could dissolve and, and become useless like a powder because it wasn't pure. But what he's saying here is you need to become pure as you walk with me because if you just choose at some point in time to say, you know what, I'm tired of trying this stuff to live for God. I'm tired of doing that. And what happens is your example of not abiding, you need to abide in him so you stay consistent in your walk with him. So you stay consistent in your love for him, your passion and your commitment and your actions your heart, your soul, your strength. 
And if you do, then the world will not trample you underfoot like it says here. It says that man will push it away. That man will shove it out and throw it out and walk over it and it's no good. It does not say God's not, God's going to do that. It says man will do that. Here's the deal. If you're here right now and you say, but John, I don't walk like that. I've been saying things and doing things and going places and treating people ways that is not in a way that expresses my love for God. What am I going to do? You're going to go back and abide with Him. Because He's going to draw you unto Himself as His child. He's longing for you to walk with Him right now. He's longing for you to, to draw close to Him because He's going to display His love over and over and over again. Or maybe it's that you don't know Christ at all, that you've said, I have never given my heart to God like that. I've never given my life to God before. I don't know what exactly it means. Will you help me with that? That's what he wants us to do today. Respond to what he's saying. Count the cost. Make a choice that you know what you're doing. And if you're just walk, drifting away, you're a believer, and you're just saying, I'm just living my life whatever I want, and whatever comes out, comes out. doesn't matter to me. But you need to abide in Him. He's calling you back to Him and saying, you need to start living for me so the people of this world don't trample over you because it's of no use what you're trying to tell them. He wants you to give that testimony example. So how are you going to express your love for God this week? See, if we go back to that first question, we go back to that first question, how would somebody know that you go back to this, if I love God, how would somebody know that you love God? Can you answer that question? Would they know you love God by how your conversation is? By how your conversations on social media are? By how you make the choices that are right? How you treat the people that you talk with at a restaurant when the order comes out wrong. Do you really do you lose your mind over just a plate of food? How, how are people going to know? Are they going to see it in you? How would somebody know that you love God? It's not a checklist. It's a relationship. And then that last question is, how would you convince somebody, someone to love God, that they should love God just as much as you do? You know, I think we should live with that thought in our mind. I think we should live with the thought in our heart and our mind that I want people to know that I love God. It, it, yes, by our actions, but they need to know it by our words as well. If you never tell somebody why you live your life the way you do in an honorable, faithful way as a friend or whatever else, if you never tell them that God says that without me, you will die and go and spend an eternity in a place called hell. That's the reality of not having a relationship with God. You've got to tell them at some point. I preached a text out of Jonah chapter 3 this week at a revival service. And Jonah chapter 3 is Jonah going to a place that he did not like to go to. Nobody there was going to like him because he was a Jew. And nobody he could have been killed on the spot as soon as he entered the city. He probably still had a little bit of a stink from the inside of a whale. And he was walking around Nineveh telling them, repent, turn to God, or in 40 days you're going to be destroyed. He didn't worry about what anybody thought. He didn't worry about whether they listened or not. He didn't worry about if they responded. All he did was be obedient to God and go and do. He didn't like it too much. These are mean, awful people that are going to kill my people. I don't like them. Folks, there's people all around you that the reason probably why they're mean, the reason why they're probably not the nicest people to hang around, the reason why they live life the way they do, they don't know God. And you're the one with the answer. You and 84 other churches and other Bible-believing churches in our, in our area, we're not gaining ground on lostness. Somebody needs to know you need to convince them to love God. Not you, you're not the Holy Spirit, but you've got to tell them. It's not going to come from osmosis, like here, come a little closer, we'll go to lunch a few more times, then you're going to become a Christian. That's not how that's going to work. You've got to tell them. 
And that means loving God consistently. Are you ready to love him above above everything else? Are you ready to say, if you don't know Christ, are you ready to say, here's my life. I want to live it for you. I want to love you unconditionally. I want to love you in a committedly. I want to love you consistently. Are you ready? Because that's what he's calling you to. Doesn't matter if we're 80 or doesn't matter if we're 8. He wants us to do the same thing. You got to know. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that your love is so powerful. Thank you that you bring us hope and life and peace and comfort and joy. So, Father, help us to share that with other people. Help it to where people know that if they walk around us, that they will experience and see and hear and know that we love you, that we understand your hope in this life, that we do have hope in this life. We are not living without hope. Father, that we live with joy and with peace in our hearts. And even through tragedy and struggle, we live with peace knowing you're walking with us. We live with peace knowing we have an assurance of being in your presence when we leave this earth. Father, help us to live like we love you. And then, Father, all the other relationships around us are going to look so different. The more we love you, the more we'll love our spouse. The more we love you, the more we'll love our friends. The more we love you, the more we'll love the, th- the people of the world around us that we live. We need to love you first. So, Father, if there's someone here that needs to just pray and come to you at the altar, just say, Lord, I'm going to love you above everything else. Lord, help them to make that choice. Father, there's somebody in this room that has never given their heart and their life to you. It's not just saying, hey, God, come into my heart and I'm going to still do what I want. No, they're choosing to follow after you. If there's somebody here today that says, I want to give my life to Christ, I pray, Father, they'll respond to your word. Lord, this is your invitation for us. You invite us to respond whenever your word is spoken. We we make a choice. Either yes, Father, I'll follow, or no, I'm not going to listen. And Father, at the end of that, this passage that we read it says he who has ears let him hear because this is a hard passage it's hard and some people don't want to hear it but God those that are listening right now I pray that we will make a choice to place you first that we will love you above everything else so help us to choose today in Jesus name amen As you come and have an invitation, I believe, um, I'll be right here to respond. If you want to pray, however you want to make a decision to follow after Christ today, I pray that you'll come as we sing, as you stand.